Two years ago today, the global financial system teetered on the edge of collapse. Catastrophe, some say, was averted, but we do all know the economy still hasn't quite recovered from those dark days of September 2008. Take a look at the S&P financials. The index is down some 22 percent. Citigroup, AIG, Bank of America were among the financial institutions that required massive government aid to survive, all still down since Lehman's collapse. And of even more interest to most Americans, the economy has shed more than six million jobs since September of 2008. We have a very special guest with us for the hour to mark the anniversary of Lehman's bankruptcy and to take us forward. Peter Solomon is the founder of investment bank Peter J. Solomon Company. He also served as a top Lehman executive uh, throughout the 1980s. And, you know, Peter, you can almost start this off with saying, what have we learned? What, what is different right now? But I want to ask you, you know, it, so many people said after the implosion of Lehman that the Wall Street model was dead. Investment banking, as it existed, would no longer survive. Is Wall Street back? Wall Street is back, mostly back. It's modified, it's changed. Um, the growth of the smaller firms like ours have become more important. And uh, equally, on the other side, it's more oligopolistic. <laughs> you only have three or four major firms now because you've lost so many firms like Lehman and Bear Stearns. So uh, it's um, sort of bifurcated, but it's the same place. Arguably, you know, we learned how interconnected Wall Street and Main Street were in the depths of the crisis. And you could say that that really was not understood uh, up until those dark moments. Do you think that we would still be battling a recession, still be battling towards recovery some two years later if Lehman had not failed? I don't. I actually don't think. I think there was a buildup towards a crisis. I think Lehman Brothers was the lancing of the crisis and everything exploded from that. But I think it was just simply an incredible series of miscalculations uh, by all parties. It, as, as I've testified in front of the financial community, uh, financial commission, everybody was wrong here. They're, they're, they're all villains. Uh, if, you, if you counted all the villains, you wouldn't have time for the solution <laughs> or, the, or the remedy. But even if there are so many villains in this story, could the story have been different? Would the narrative now have been different? Yes. I if, think it would, we don't failed. know uh, because we had all these underlying problems. We had too much leverage in the system. We had irresponsibility in the right. system. We had bad management. We had bad applicability of regulations. So if not Lehman, perhaps something else. But it was Lehman, and, uh, and we did have a catastrophe. Why does it matter two years later that Lehman did fail? Because it triggered off a whole series of events uh, and did not give the world time enough to adjust. What, what is off, uh, it, it takes time to build up to crises and it takes time to, to go through them and, and solve them and work out of them. The crises took maybe 10 or 15 years to build up. Um, it could take uh, 10 years to uh, resolve. I want to play for you now a soundbite from the former CEO, Dick Fold. I really cannot answer you, sir as to why the Federal Reserve and the Treasury and the SEC together chose not to not only provide support for liquidity, but also not to have opened the window to Lehman that Sunday night as it did to all of our competitors. And the autopsy still has not yet been completed. Um, we're talking through what happened, why it matters, and what's next uh, for Wall Street and for the executives running that company. Uh, Peter Solomon is with us throughout this hour. He's a former vice chairman at Lehman Brothers, obviously now with his own firm uh, that bears his name. And I want to bring in Bloomberg's chief financial correspondent, Christine Harbour. She covered the financial crisis from the beginning. She continues uh, to cover Wall Street now. Thank you. For joining us, thank you, both of you. Uh, I wanted to play that soundbite from Dick Fold because it still gets us to that question of what happened. We still don't know. We've had legislative solutions to prevent what happened from happening again, and yet we still haven't answered what happened in those final hours. Why, Christine, was Lehman Brothers allowed to fail? What's amazing is we don't know, and we may never know. I mean, there are people who say they think. The government decided they had to allow somebody to fail. There was no political will 
to save everybody. They may have recognized what the uh, what the results would be, but they they couldn't do anything. They felt politically they couldn't do anything. Of course, the Fed has argued that legally they couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. There are people who question that who say they have emergency powers that they can invoke, and that's a decision they made. Um, it, it's it's a good question, and and Peter obviously knows a lot of the people who are involved in this, and may you know have some views as well. Well, one of the reasons why there is so so many there are so many theories and conspiracies is because what happened the next day when right. AIG was saved. So that question of why save Bear, why save AIG, and why not save Lehman leads us to the question: Did the government choose not to save them, or were they truly unable to do so? They screwed up. The government, just, the yeah, Bush administration. Everybody did. Everybody did. It was a total train wreck. Uh, they didn't understand the implications. I'm not sure I would have understood the implications. Incidentally, I was not at Lehman. I haven't I've been at the Lehman time. since the 80s. Right. Uh, but um, they didn't understand the implications. Once they understood the implications, they uh, 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 miraculously had the powers. Mm -hmm. So the power, the discussion that we don't have the powers in the federal government is clearly an absurd argument because they found them the next day. Fold's comment that they didn't open the window is, of course, correct. Uh, but they didn't think they had to open the window. That was a miscalculation. Fold was dealing with lack of capital. As, as the uh, general counsel of the Federal Reserve said, lack of capital, uh, lack of confidence, and illiquidity. And he couldn't do all three of them. He couldn't beat all three at one time. Um, it was just a, a screw up. Um, I want to put up a full screen right now, a, a quote from the former head of the Treasury, Hank Paulson, former CEO of Goldman Sachs, who in those uh, heated moments, that last few moments negotiating what was going to happen next with Lehman Brothers, said in his account of the crisis, it was the British. The British screwed us. He's referencing there Barclays backing out of uh, a hastily arranged agreement to purchase Lehman Brothers. Is it the British fault? Well, it hasn't been the British fault since 1775. <laughs> Uh, it was not the British fault. Uh, the fault is in the summer. There's a wonderful book we all know by Barbara Tuckman called The Guns of August. And in The Guns of August, she says, she points out it wasn't the shooting of the Archduke Ferdinand that began the World War I. Mm -hmm. They knew World War was coming during the summer, and no one did anything about it. They talked about it, they hemmed and hawed, and they did nothing, and the Duke was shot and the war started. Lehman Brothers was the shooting of Archduke Ferdinand in the financial crisis. Paulson had time to resolve it. Fold had time to resolve it. The Fed had time to resolve it. And no one took it seriously enough. Why? Why didn't anyone take it seriously enough? And now that we've got these new arrangements in place, you know, new structure essentially, new regulation for a financial system, are those, you know, forward-looking regulators there now? Yeah, well, one thing that was so intriguing in reading the Volucas report, which is the bankruptcy examiner's report on Lehman, is reading about some of the actions the regulators tried to take that summer. Mm -hmm. The SEC asked the Fed, which at that, the New York Fed, at, run by Tim Geithner at that time, to come in and do some stress tests on Lehman. And according to the Volucas report, they did a number of stress tests, all of which Lehman failed, until finally they asked Lehman to do its own stress test, which it was able to pass. Now, that raises the question, couldn't they have done something? Now, they might argue they didn't have the powers to do it, they can't force a private company to do anything. I don't know, Peter, do you think that's a believable argument? What could they have done? Oh, I think it's all bull. Uh, I think it's just a failure of, of, of leadership all the way around. Um, Fold knew he didn't have enough capital, did raise some capital, but didn't raise enough. He was in merger negotiations. Geithner and the Fed didn't do what they were supposed to do. The White House, I probably didn't want to get involved. It was a lame duck, in essence, uh, presidency. Uh, the uh, Republicans weren't very uh, popular. Mm -hmm. And I think it just uh, fell between the cracks. It's an amazing thing to say, but I think Lehman Brothers fell between the cracks. And uh, it was pathetic. It was a and pathetic demonstration of leadership by almost everybody. You said earlier that you think um, the failure was a failing to, to deal with it ahead of time. Do you think, as Margaret asked, that they would be more more there'd be more foresight uh, foresight now if a problem like that was brewing? Regulators, maybe because of the financial reforms we've seen, mm -hmm. would be better positioned to deal with them. Definitely, they will definitely be in a better position. The the bill, uh, the the financial restructuring bill, uh, is a, is an okay bill. It's not phenomenal, but it does do certain very important things. It brings in insurance. It it. Uh, 
Uh, I like the Consumer Protection Agency. I would have had it independent, incidentally, not under the Treasury. Um, I think there are a lot of parts of it. The Council on Regulators is a good idea. I would have centralized it because I don't believe in councils, um, and I, I would have had more power. But I think it. Yes, I think it, it. We are better able to handle this problem. Gosh knows what the next problem well, is. Well, interestingly, the man who you know, seven hundred billion dollar man, Neil Kashkari, who ran TARP, was on this program months ago and said, you know, financial reform. It's not. But he doesn't think there's been enough to de-risk the banks. He still thinks too big to fail is an issue. Um, I want to quickly play for you here a soundbite from Dick Fold himself. When we get to that question of culpability, I want to ask you, Christine, what happens next and are there going to be charges? Is someone going to be hung out to dry here? Listen in. I did not, I myself, did not see the depth and violence of the crisis. I did not see the contagion. I believe we made poor judgments and timing for the assets that we bought and for the businesses that we supported. Would I love today be able to reach back and take those? Yes. Were they poor judgments and timing here? And both of you, do we, was it simply that? Are there going to be charges, criminal charges, SEC charges against Lehman Brothers CEO Dick Fold. Well, we know that they're investigating. We know, know that they're trying to build cases. They're trying to figure out if they can charge. Um, they have already had some high profile problems trying to charge the Bear Stearns fund managers, and that didn't work out. So there's a really high hurdle here if they want to bring criminal charges, of course, and, and even if they want to bring SEC charges. Obviously, politically, the Lehman Brothers issue is still so hot that for the government to be able to hold somebody accountable would be would send a strong signal. Mm -hmm. At the same time, being able to prove, you have to find the smoking gun that can prove that they knew they were t they were misinforming investors, they were mismarking assets. And it seems, I mean, as we see Mr. Fold there say, they are at least claiming they just made it. They just made mistakes. Yeah, and it sounds like you think the wide the the net goes wider. Than I just think that stupidity is a good defense. <laughs> Wheeling and dealing. M&A has picked up steam on Wall Street, and so far this year, $624 billion worth of deals have been done. For all of last year, we saw $807 billion. In 08, $0.13 trillion in deals were completed. Is the rebound for real? Peter Solomon uh, has been with us throughout the hour, and I want to get to to what you're engaged with these days um, with your boutique firm. I mean, M and A, we're talking about being very active right now. Is this simply uh, a rush to to beat you know tax deadlines and tax changes for private equity firms coming in in 2011? What what is firing this up right now? Well, I think you do have a point there. I think private equity firms are. Uh, uh, taking advantage or, or anticipating there will be a change in the tax code. Uh, for the first time in a long time, there were more sellers, more money. I think it was 140 billion of sales by private equity people, as opposed to 135 billion of purchases, and that's the first time that's happened for a very long time. Uh, but in the strategic area, there is a pickup in mergers. But I would argue that's because uh, companies have built up their balance sheets. Uh, there's enormous liquidity in the balance sheets. Uh, the ability to finance at very low rates is, is uh, available. Stocks are selling at a fair value, more or less. Mm -hmm. So the cost of capital for companies to acquire is very low right now. In fact, almost every acquisition you make will be accretive because of the low cost of capital and the availability of capital. But there's a second reason, which is not as uh, pleasant. The second reason is there's very little growth in the American economy. So to, uh, companies are faced with the dilemma of increasing revenues or sales. Mm -hmm. They've figured out how to increase earnings, but they increase earnings by cutting people, and that's one of our unemployment issues. So we need, the companies need to increase revenues, and they, they're having trouble doing them in their businesses alone, so they're acquiring new revenues, and they're acquiring abroad where there's greater growth. Is there a danger in that, if the motivation is to essentially buy revenue growth? I mean, it, what's what's the risk Hobson's there? Hobson's choice. Mm -hmm. You want to stay where you are and have no sales growth, eventually people say, you know, they have no sales growth. Mm -hmm. in, day in, in the end of the day, companies sell because they, they have increases in revenues or sales, not over a long period of time because they cut costs. 
So you have all these companies, the IBMs uh, and others, acquiring now. Now, interestingly, uh, illustratively, Cisco yesterday started, decided they would pay a dividend. And companies are now repurchasing stock because they have these huge buildups of cash mm -hmm. and they've got to figure out what to do with it. So they can pay it out, they can use that as an asset to, to leverage can, into purchase you know, they something. They can raise their dividend, they, can, they, they don't seem to be want to spend it on capital expenditures, and that yeah. is again a problem in the American economy. Our um, senior M&A reporter was forecasting that we would see a wave of private equity offerings uh, of some of the entities they bought out years ago in the next few weeks. Do you see private equity getting more active in M&A? Well, I see him getting more assets. active in M&A. I see him getting active in the IPO market. Uh, but uh, but the M&A business gets you, the sale of your asset gets you at 100 percent. When you do an IPO and you're in a, you're a private equity person, you don't get out all the way, and it takes you much longer to get out. So yes, I think you'll see uh, trades between trades between private mm -hmm. equity firms. It's happening now. It will continue to happen. Trades is a way to monetize the asset yes. rather than an IPO. Yes. All right. Some final thoughts now with our special guest Peter. Solomon, former vice chairman of Lehman Brothers during the 80s, now uh, running his own boutique firm. And I want to sort of button up our conversation because we began this talking about Lehman Brothers and, and the failure. Um, the solutions there with a consumer protection agency, you were in favor of it. Yes. Not so supportive of Elizabeth Warren, perhaps right. too strident. Um, Volcker Rule, you, you think that financial reform helped, but it didn't really address the, the oh, fundamental yeah. issues here. Of, of well, what the Volcker Rule, I, I think, was a sideshow. Mm -hmm. I think proprietary trading didn't cause the problems. I don't think investments in the hedge funds by the firms or uh, other things caused the problems. I'm not opposed to the Volcker Rule, but I think it was a sideshow. Well, in December, we'll get the, the official autopsy of Lehman from the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission. You've testified to yourself. Yes. Do you think that we, we will see and we should see prosecution? Will we see SEC charges and should Dick Fold face them? I'm not going to comment on that. Dick is an old friend of mine. I think there's some very serious issues like the Repo 105 issue. I think the report of the uh, a trustee who, who was cited by Christine uh, is a very re Volucus, revelatory, Anton yes, very revelatory report. Mm -hmm. But I'm not smart enough to know that. Well, transition to me then what this new normal is, um, because you, you've said boutique firms like yourselves, yes. uh, your firm, are advantaged here. Yes. We've also seen, you know, Basel just this weekend try to come up with another solution to the problems itself and prevent them. Are we safer and? What is that normal? We are safer. We need more capital in the banking system. We need to cover, as the financial reform bill does, non-banking institutions that are in finance, which it does cover. Uh, it is more comprehensive. The key, though, is capital. Mm -hmm. and, and after the key of capital, the key is good management and real application of, of the regulations that are there. Unfortunately, we can't guarantee uh, good management, and we can't. We obviously can't guarantee uh, regulation uh, applied correctly. But from your perspective, business is looking pretty better, good. Better these days. Um, it's been fun having you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Nice to see you.